purpose of this afternoon, afternoon's discussion, is to get you into these two standard libraries, loss and what happened. And before I start, how many of you have worked before with loss and or what happened? Related to eigenvalue problems, certainly, right? They, they have a lot in common with each other. 
Um, some examples of linear equation systems, at least in, in relative to computational chemistry. So you see orbital response equations uh, in, in analytic gradient theory. Uh, for example, you have something called the couple perturbed hartree fock equations. That's a linear equation system to be solved. And the solution to those, right, so the, the input matrix to begin with would be something called a molecular orbital Hessian. Don't worry if you don't know these things already. It's not important. It's just an example. Uh, and, and X would be some set of orbital response parameters associated with whatever derivative you're taking. Hessian matrix inversion. So this might come up, for example, in the, in the associated with geometry stepping, uh, in the geometry optimization, for example. Solving linear systems of equations come up in the context of optimizing molecular structures or scanning potential energy surfaces and the like, linear equation systems. Um, and then finally, matrix matrix multiplication that Professor Vileyev told you a great deal about. It's very important in numerous contexts in computational chemistry. Since so many of our problems, especially in quantum chemistry, for example, <coughs> they can be formulated in terms of algebraic expressions. So whenever you have an expansion of some unknown function in a basis set, for example, a molecular orbital expanded in a, as a linear combination of atomic orbitals, or an n-electron wave function expanded in as a linear combination of Slater determinants, things like this. That sort of an algebraic representation of the problem frequently leads to these kinds of matrix-matrix multiplications. And in fact, you're better off if you can formulate your problem as an algebra. If you, if you are going the algebraic route, you want to formulate it in terms of matrix algebra, because then you can take advantage of things like Blossom. Uh, couple cluster theory is my personal favorite. This is a, a many-body algebraic problem. This is a set system of nonlinear uh, algebraic equations. It tends to be very large in dimension, and uh, we formulate most of the terms in this uh, in these kinds of expressions as matrix matrix multiplications. Again, a lot of them tend to be very large matrices. I don't mean billions this time, okay? But million that's reasonable. We counted those quite a few times. Um, Self-consistent field theory, Rotan's uh, equations for the basis set expand, basis set representation of either hartree fock theory or Cohen-Sham density functional theory. So much of the components of these problems tend to be cast in terms of matrix-matrix multiplications. And in fact, we're going to use hartree fock theory and the SCF algorithm as our major example to work through uh, starting tomorrow. I'll say a little bit more about that later. Any questions so far? How are we doing? Clear? Okay. Good. BLOS stands for Basic Linear Algebra Subprograms. I always thought the word subprogram sounds very dated these days, right? I mean, we, we think of things as functions. In poor training, you might use the word subroutine, right, still, but subprogram is, I don't know the last time I heard that, that wasn't in this, in this particular acronym. But it's a bunch of functions that implement various types of matrix algebra that we're going to talk about. There's three different levels. Blast one, blast two, and blast three. Okay, not very unique names, but, but still to get the point across. Blast one, level one has to do with taking norms of vectors, dot products between vectors, scaling vectors, or the addition of a scalar multiple of one vector to another. It's a very important process. In fact, that was Professor Vallejo's primary example from yesterday when you were examining flock counts, various sizes of these things. That this is called an axe speed. Call an axe because if you look at the mathematical expression for this, it's alpha times x plus y, right? A times x plus y. So alpha is the scalar, x is one vector. So you're multiplying this one vector times a scalar plus another vector y. It's an axe speed. That's what it looks like, right? Dax speed that he was referring to means that it's in double precision. But I'll say more about that in a few minutes. Okay, that's blast level one. Uh, scalars have a lot to do with BLAS level 1. Simple, matri uh, simple vector uh, algebra, no matrices at BLAS level 1. BLAS level 2, now we get into matrix vector operations. Matrix vector operations. I, I'm not aware of any clever little acronyms for these, but, but this, is a, this is the typical thing. In all of what I'm showing you now, alpha and beta are just numbers, right? They're simple scalars. A capital Bold face letter like this, that represents a matrix. Lowercase bold face represents a vector. So now what I'm doing is I'm taking a matrix times a vector. A matrix times a vector is a vector. I multiply that by a scalar, and I add it to beta times another vector. Right, to 
give me my target. So that's that's a standard kind of BLOS2 matrix vector sort of operation. There are variations on these things. Okay? BLOS level three, that's your matrix matrix operations. So where two factors that involve are now matrices. And this is the one that gets so much focus in optimization. Uh, it's it's and that's why Professor Vallejo spent a great deal of time on it at this point. So the general expression here. Our target is C. I'm multiplying matrices A and B with a constant out in front of them and adding it to beta times whatever was in C in the first place. Okay? So that's my general matrix multiply, G, M, M, Gem. And so D gem, for example, is double precision, general matrix multiply. And there are lots of different functions for these of various types inside the loss functions. LAPAC, linear algebra package. Um, this is good for solving things that matter to, to computational chemistry, such as systems of linear equations, just as we already described, eigenvalue problems down here, and others that I, another one that I didn't talk about before, but there are still lots of examples. In fact, there are ever increasing numbers of examples of the use of singular value decomposition problems in quantum chemistry. These are coming up more and more often as people are looking to, to reduce the scaling of, of computational, uh, especially in quantum chemistry calculations. SVD, it turns out to be a very important technique. I've already talked about eigenvalues, I've already talked about linear systems. A, a, a singular value decomposition now, this can apply to a rectangular matrix. That's what I mean. A now is a rectangular matrix. I don't have the same row and column dimensions anymore. For, for eigenvalue problems, I do, okay? But I don't for, for the singular value decomposition. This is like a generalized eigenvalue problem in some sense. And then I have now a set of we're called singular values. This is a, a rectangular matrix sigma, whose diagonal, it's a diagonal rectangular matrix. You have to think about what that means. I'll let you think about that on your own. A diagonal re a, a, a rectangular matrix of, of positive values, all positive diagonal values, who, uh, whose values are decreasing, okay? And the smaller those singular values get, the less important are the singular vectors represented in the matrices U and V on either side. Now, I'm not going to go any further into SVD problems, okay? They're really worth studying. They're very, very interesting. In a sense, as I said before, they're like generalized eigenvalue problems. And they're beginning to be more and more useful, especially in quantum chemistry. Okay? Uh, I wanted to say something about the eigenvalue problem. Some of the some of the, new, the technology that is in LAPAC is, is it has been carefully worked on for many, many years. So you have some of the best modern algorithms available in the current version of LAPAC. Uh, for example, in, in the eigenvalue problem, well, what do you think of when you think of eigenvalue problems? Let's go away from that for a second so you don't look all the down. Th think about an eigenvalue problem. You have all solved eigenvalue problems before, right? So you had a linear algebra, or at least a matrix algebra class before. You might have done this in, say, I don't know if you had to do this in ordinary differential equations as well. Maybe you had to do this in PCAM, any number of things. What do you think of when you have to solve an eigenvalue problem? How do you go about solving? Well, numerically or uh, just by hand? Say again? Uh, what, numerically or just by hand? By hand. If you were to solve it by hand, what would you do? Diagonal, so how, what does that mean, diagonalizing it? What do you actually do? I've got a matrix, right? A matrix of numbers. And if you're doing it by hand, please, no bigger than a three by three, right? Well, okay. <laughs> you solve a characteristic equation. So you take the original matrix minus some diagonal lambdas on the diagonal, right? And then you take the determinant of this, the characteristic equation is the determinant of that set equal to zero. So you solve for the roots of that characteristic equation. Okay? Doing this by hand for a 2x2 two two or a 3x3, three three, fine. 3x3 three three can be a pain, depending on what you get. But when you get larger than that, I guess, it, is it past the fifth order polynomial that you no longer have analytic solutions? Because what do you do if you have a 2x2, two two, the, the characteristic equation, the secular equation, is quadratic. Well, we all know how to solve a quadratic equation. I hope, right? And then the cubic equation, yes, you can factorize that and get out exact roots. Um, I think you can do this for fourth order and fifth order, if I remember correctly off the top of my head. But I don't think you can beyond fifth order. There's no analytic solution 
for a second statement higher polynomial? Is it not even five? Just four? Okay. Thank you. I, I don't like to solve those things in the first place, so that's why I, I don't do it. So what are they doing in an eigenvalue problem? I told you that, that we can solve eigenvalue problems for thousands to, I mean, they've done full CI for what, 65 billion determinants before? How do you do that? You're not putting together a characteristic equation and kind of putting together a, a 65 billion order polynomial and seeing what you come up with, I promise you that. So what are they doing instead? So one algorithm is this QR algorithm. Uh, this, and, and I'm not actually telling you what they really do, right? I never tell you what they really do inside the code. That's always ugliest. So the QR idea here is that you, any square matrix can be uh, factored into a product of an orthogonal matrix that we'll call Q and an upper triangular matrix, uh, or a, what do they call a Hessenberg form matrix that's called R. And, and the idea, since this is an orthogonal matrix, all that means is that its, its rows or its columns are orth orthogonal to each other. In fact, we'll say it's even orthonormal, so the dot products of rows are, are going to be just Kronecker deltas, or columns. So if I take the transpose of Q times itself, I get the identity matrix, which also means that the transpose of Q is its inverse, right? So uh, the idea behind this is that if I start out with, if this is the matrix that I'm looking to calculate the eigenvalues for, I'm going to call that my zeroth matrix, that's my starting matrix, and I'll do a QR decomposition. This is something, again, I'm, I'm sort of sweeping something under the rug here. I'm not telling you how we do the QR decomposition. That's another discussion. But if you trust me that there is such a thing as a QR decomposition, I'm saying we do it. And then I'm going to define something new, a new matrix that I'll give A1 as a subscript, that is the same two matrices but multiplied in reverse order. That's not the same thing as A0, that's a new matrix, but I've just chosen to multiply those in reverse order. Why? The reason can be seen if now I take this product and I multiply it by the identity, because the identity is just Q transpose Q, right? Just like I said up here. So that's the same thing. But then look, I've got Q times R. Q times R is A0, so I fill that in. Now I've got Q transpose, a0, Q0, remember A0 is just A. So, and since Q transpose is the same thing as Q inverse, this is a similarity transform. And the thing about a similarity transformation is the transformed matrix has exactly the same eigenvalues as the original matrix. And what's special about this matrix is that it has a little bit more diagonal structure. So I repeat this process. I take this new matrix, I do this kind of decomposition, QR decomposition, I define the new iterate, and find, and find its similarity transform. And that gives me something that's a little bit more diagonal. And eventually I make this thing converge, right? After K iterations or so, it's finally converged so that this resulting matrix is a diagonal matrix to within some precision, machine precision of the iterations. And then, the Q's here become the matrix of eigenvectors. So that's how you get out both eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Again, what I just described, the actual algorithm that I just described, is not very efficient, and it's not really what they do, but it forms the mathematical basis of what they do. There's some very clever algorithms in there. Implicitly shifted uh, QR decompositions and things like this that we don't need to talk about. So if you just trust me this far, this is the idea behind an eigenvalue solver inside of how are we doing? Questions so far? Okay. So, um, naming conventions. There's a lot going on in terms of the names of all of these functions. The history, before I show you that, the history of LaPac and Bloss goes back to when I was a kid and had no knowledge whatsoever of, of linear algebra. So, uh, so you know, mid to late 70s is when these things were being developed. I think the first release of LaPac was in like 1979 or so. And so the, the original versions of these were all Fortran. Okay, appropriately, they were all Fortran. Um, which means that nobody wanted any names for any of their subprograms that were more than six characters. Right? As we know, standard Fortran 77, six character limit. So that's part of the reason for these very, very succinct and not 
very intuitive sounding names for some of the programs that you see inside Blossom or Mac. But we can at least get, we can understand a bit of their convention. Now I'm not giving you the whole picture here at all, right? There's a lot more, I'm just showing you some key things that matter to us. There are nice summaries of these online. Google is your friend if you really want to know what every last bit of this means. Um, the first letter of each routine has an S, D, C, or Z in front of it. If you're dealing with single precision real numbers, there's an S, right? If you're dealing with double precision real numbers, there's your D. Uh, C is single precision complex, Z is double precision complex. What that means in Fortran is easier than what it means in C, by the way. So I'm gonna push, I'm gonna push complex representations to the side for today's discussion and just focus on real. Does everybody understand what we mean when we talk about single and double precision? Okay, I see a lot of nods. I'm gonna make sure that everybody does anyway. So, so single precision. In C or C++, we would call that a float, right? That's the type. And on standard architectures, I'm, I'm gonna say most architectures, the way I really should put it, on most architectures, uh, a single precision number, floating point number, is represented by four bytes up there, right? It's 32 bits. A double precision floating point number is eight bytes, so 64 bits. How many decimals of precision does that give you? Well, you can write little programs to test exactly how many of this does, but suffice to say, approximately a single, a single precision or a float, a four byte number, you can represent it roughly seven to eight decimal places of precision. Double precision, you're gonna get 15 to 16, okay? That's what you can expect. And 15 to 16 is necessary for most of what we do. Not all, but most of what we do in, in computational chemistry, especially quantum. So um, that's what we're talking about. Four bytes, eight bytes. Um, the type of matrix is also identified. That's the next component of the names of all of these things. So for example, if you're dealing with a symmetric matrix, you're gonna see an SY. If the function only applies to symmetric matrices, you're gonna see an SY in that spot. If it's general, meaning it doesn't matter the type of matrix, then you're gonna see a GE. So DGEM, for example, is double precision, general matrix, matrix multiply, that's the MM part of this. So drivers, I skipped the MM component because that I thought was obvious, but if you're solving a system of linear equations, for example, you're gonna see an SV as the end of it. EV for eigenvalues, SVD for what it stands for, singular value decomposition, right? I put da there because I thought it was obvious and I didn't actually have room to type out singular value decomposition, okay? So again, I've only given you a snapshot of the nomenclature. Look it up on Google if you really want to get the complete picture, because there are a lot of functions in these libraries, maybe, which may be useful to you in your life. Okay, good so far? Okay, do stop me if you have any questions. The interface. So this is not the ugliest slide. Oh no, there's another one that's pretty ugly coming up. So there's one of two really ugly slides in this, so bear with me. We'll get to some hands-on stuff here in about 20 minutes. Get a little bit deeper into this. DGEM. These functions tend to have a lot of arguments. It's, it's natural. They're going to be very general functions. That, that's what happens. The, the, uh, first of all, this is the operation that we're carrying out. C is alpha times matrix A times matrix B plus beta times matrix C. Okay? So that's the general matrix matrix multiplication that we talked about before. There, this is the list of arguments. I think I have types for all of them unless they're obvious. And uh, this is the order in which they come. So how do we have two, five, uh, seven, nine, uh, two, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, nine, twelve, thirteen arguments to this function. It's a lot of arguments to keep up with. Um, the first two have to do with whether or not you're, you want the transpose of either of the factor matrices. So if you're interested in, in doing Four possibilities, right? There's just four possibilities. We've got, we want C is equal to A times B, or C is equal to A transpose times B, or A B transpose, or A transpose B transpose. If you don't want the matrix and the factor to be transposed, you can look at N, just the character N, right, for normal, and if you put a T if you want it transposed, that's it. We're going to talk about what that means and how that matters for the structure of the algorithm in just a minute. 
just a few minutes. So let's say that I've got just matrix A times matrix B, no transpose in here at all. So here's C. There's A and there's B. These are all supposed to be approximately square, so just imagine that that thing is obviously rectangular square. Okay. I just didn't draw it very well. The number of rows of A is identical to the number of rows of C, right? The number of columns of B is identical to the number of columns of C. And so that's what M and N are in this case, right? This is rows of C and columns of C. It's just trying to figure out the dimensions of the problem. However, if I instead wanted, say, C equals A transpose B, then I would really want this to be A transpose, which means that I have to think about M being the, the matrix A or A transpose, all right? The way I usually think of those is what's my target? Number of rows and columns in the target matrix. That's the easiest thing to deal with. K, though, is the number of summation indices. Because what is this? An element of C, say the ij element of C, is equal to a sum over K, A i j times B, excuse me, ik times B, aj. Right? That's what this means for C equals A times B. If I wanted C equals A, B transpose, then the indices on B would be swapped. Agreed? It would be J, K instead of K, J. But it's pretty simple. Pretty simple overall. K, then, is the number of summation indices. That's the way to think of it. So the columns of A or A transpose and the rows of B or B transpose, depending on what your values of trans A and trans B are. Good so far? All right. Alpha. That's just the scalar in front of the AB product. We've got a beta that comes up down here. That's the scalar in front of C. If you don't want anything that was in C to begin with, if, you're, if A times B is your brand new C, set beta equals zero. It will overwrite what was there in the first place, okay? So A now is your left-hand matrix. B is your right-hand matrix. And now we get into distinctions, important distinctions between Fortran and C. Um, how many of you consider yourselves strictly Fortran programmers? One, two, three, four. Not a bad thing, by the way. Okay, I don't mean bad. Seven or so, okay, something like that. For you, it's just a double. Whatever you called the array, if you've named it A, right, with open parentheses, row dimension, and column dimension, you're going to hand the, the subroutine A. That's it. If you're a C programmer or a C programmer, what you're instead handing in is a pointer to double, okay? Notice, if you're thinking of these things as matrices, that's good, but I didn't say you're handing this function a pointer to pointer to double, okay? Think about, for those of you who are interested in CC++, how would you build a matrix normally? If you want to do a two-dimensional array where you have two different indices, then the name A would not be a, a double star, it would be a double star star, right? A pointer to pointer to double. That's not what you're handing it. You're handing it here, a pointer to the first element of the matrix A. We'll talk a little bit more about that in detail later when we get to the hands-on stuff, okay? Uh, same thing goes for B and C. In Fortran, you're just handing it the name of the two-dimensional array that you called the matrix, okay? In C or C++, you're again handing it to a pointer to the first element in memory for that uh, for that matrix, okay? Um, LDA, LDV, LDC, those are the last things that, that we have to talk about here. This is the dimension of the quantity that you're dealing with, the matrix that you're dealing with. Specifically, in Fortran, it's the row dimension, the number of rows, right? And in C or C++, it's the number of columns. I'll explain why with the next slide, okay? because there's a fundamental distinction between the way Fortran views matrices in memory and the way C does, right? They're transposes of each other. But you have to be careful. LDA, for example, doesn't have to be M. It can be larger than M because you might, act, the, the, the code is so general that I might want to multiply these two matrices here 
But instead, I might actually just want to multiply a piece of A, a submatrix of it. It allows you to do this. Maybe, maybe that's not the best example, but anyway, that you can do submatrices. Most of the time, I don't care. Okay, I don't make use of this. I'm telling you that that's a possibility, but I don't want it to get confused. Confused. All of our examples, we're going to use the whole matrix, okay, just to make life simple. But it's very general code. Okay. It was an ugly slide and an ugly discussion of the slide because there's a lot to show. <laughs> examples are the way to learn how to use this stuff. Why this difference between Fortran and C? Well, I won't say why. I guess I'll just say what is this difference. I don't know really why it's always been this way, but. Um, the fact is that the ordering of elements in a matrix is different between Fortran and C. So I used to, to tell my students, Fortran and C are transposes of each other. That's, and this is why I make that not very funny joke. That because if this is a matrix in Fortran, this is a five by five, there's a five by five matrix in C. Memory is just linear, right? I have a linear array of, of positions in, in memory. This is where we're going to imagine it in the computer. Starting from address 0 to address whatever, however big your memory is. And the operating system gives you access to that memory. You don't keep up with the addresses yourself. It does that for you. So if I start, if, if I want to store all of this data associated with a matrix in Fortran, the first element of that array in Fortran in memory is this one. If I go to the next word, double precision word, in memory, it it's, it's, what is stored there is that value. You with me? The next one in memory, the next double precision word in memory, contains whatever that value is, and so on and so forth. So as I step through memory, that's double precision word, that's eight bytes, right? So if I go eight bytes at a time, and I interpret each of those eight bytes as a double precision floating point number, then I am simply stepping through the matrix down the column. Starting at the beginning of the matrix here, I'm simply stepping down the column. What happens when I get to the end of the column? The next element in memory is the first element of the next column. And I keep stepping through. And it's contiguous. That's very, very important. In Fortran and in all the Blossom Pack routines, it is assumed that, that those memory elements are all contiguous. There's no space, there's no gap in memory for them, right? So when I end a column, the very next element in memory is the first one at the top of the next column, and so on and so forth. We say in Fortran, then, that if I'm accessing the elements of this matrix in Fortran, the left-hand index is what we call the fastest running index. Okay? It's the one that, that if I really want to step through it, I have to be updating my row index faster than I update the column index. C is exactly transposed. C and C++. The first element in memory is that one. But the second element, the second double precision word, the next eight bytes in memory, is the next one on the same row. And I move over another eight bytes, it's the next one. And then so on and so forth. And when I get to the end of a row, hmm, that depends. Is the next element in memory going to be this? It depends on how you allocate the matrix. In C and C++, you have control over exactly how you allocate. If you use dynamic memory allocation, for example, you have control over exactly how you allocate memory for a matrix. I'm not talking about static allocation. I'm talking about dynamic allocation at runtime using something like malloc or new. In that case, you are allowed in C and C++, and it assumes you know what you're doing. It's a big assumption sometimes for most of us, but you're allowed in C and C++ to do separate memory allocations for every row, if you wish. In fact, that was the first way I was ever taught, to allocate memory in C for a matrix L. You allocate memory for each row, you allocate a set of pointers to the beginning of each row, and then you can access it like a matrix. Right? Same usual notation and everything. But if you do that for your memory with C and C++, you can't use that matrix with BLOSS and WPAC because there's no guarantee from the system that each of those rows will be contiguous in memory. In fact, what will happen is the compiler will say, sure, here's your first row. I'm sorry, the operating system will say, here's your first row. You can step through memory contiguously. When you get to the end of that row, you want to go to the next one. It is usually not the next element in memory. There will be a gap. Or who knows where it puts it. It might put it all the way at the end of memory. 
and then you go way out in the middle of nowhere to get to the next row. But you can step through that one, and then the next one may be earlier in memory, only the operating system knows. So you can't do that with Fortran, and, with, excuse me, with C and C++. You have to allocate the memory differently. It's very simple, and I'll show you an example shortly. But you must allocate the memory so that every element of the matrix is contiguous, right? There are no gaps at all. All right. Um, so that difference, this matters a lot. Because, again, memory is linear, right? Memory is linear. The operating system has no clue what, how you're interpreting that memory. It's just memory with lots of bits. Some are zeros and some are ones. That's all it knows. It again assumes that you know what you're doing. So how are we going to interpret these things? If I've got a C program doing the interpreting and it sees a series of contiguous eight by doubles and it's interpreting them as double precision floating point numbers, it's assuming, in the context of my program anyway, it is going to assume that those are contiguous along rows of the matrix. But the same data in that memory, one element right after another, from the perspective of a Fortran program, is contiguous along the columns. So Fortran simply sees the matrix as the transpose of what C sees it as. Okay? It's, a, it's a, an important distinction when it comes to the implementation of the blossom of that. And it can be exceedingly confusing. And here's why. DGEM, that's going to be my example. The standard interfaces, when you call Bloss and Lapat functions, you call them using Fortran code interfaces. That does not mean that the underlying code that actually does the operation for you is written in Fortran. It only means that to get the data into the function, there's a Fortran library function that has to be called. That's the standard interface. There are C and C++ interfaces out there. But most of us in computational chemistry write our codes assuming that Fortran interface, even if the rest of our code is C++, we still assume that that Fortran interface exists because that's the one that we're, we're, we can, are usually guaranteed is available on whatever computer we're going to compile the code. So we have to go with that Fortran interface. At this point in time, we don't have a choice. So the standard interfaces are, are Fortran 77 slash 90. For the purpose of the interface, it doesn't matter which. That means that you have to have some adjustments by a C, C++ code when you're calling the functions. Uh, so, if, let's say we want to do that matrix multiplication. Bear with me on this, okay, because this, this can be very confusing. This can be very confusing. Let's say I want to carry out this simple matrix matrix multiplication. Matrix A times matrix B to give matrix C. It doesn't get any simpler than that. The problem is that when A is passed into the Fortran, if I'm in a C and C++ program, remember, the rows of A are contiguous in memory, right? But when that memory is viewed from the perspective of the Fortran, no, it sees it as the transpose of what C sees it as. So if I were simply to hand in A and B to the Fortran code, it would care, it would, and I just told it, you know, N and N for those two trans A and trans B arguments in DGM, it would actually carry out the multiplication of A transpose times B transpose, which is not what I want. You see what I mean? It would automatically do this. No questions asked. It'd be perfectly happy to do that for me, that wrong calculation for me. So we, get, we don't want that. In order to get what we want, we instead, I, I have to imagine it as giving me C transpose. So, what is C transpose? Well, that's A B times B quantity transpose, which is B transpose times A transpose, right? You reverse the order of the factors and take the transpose of each. So, in order to call correctly, call DGEM correctly from C and C++, you have to pass in the matrices in the opposite order, but using the same trans A and trans B characters. They get through. They get through very carefully, and you'll see what I'm talking about. When we call DGEM, we have to change the ordering of the matrices. So I don't give it A times B. I actually tell it B times A, so that Fortran will give me what I really wanted in the first place. Notice I don't have to move any data around. I don't have to do anything ugly like that. I just simply change the order of the arguments, and it works perfectly. <coughs> and I'll show you an example soon. Okay. How are we doing? Right. All right, good. 
Lepak, right? So the matrix matrix multiplication DGM that's in BLOSS, BLOSS level three. This, uh, this is the symmetric matrix eigenvalue solver, double precision, right? So double precision, symmetric matrix, EV for eigenvalue, D, S, Y, E, V. So if I wanted to just solve for the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the matrix, that's what I'm going to use. And it's a real symmetric matrix, double precision. Here's a list of, of ugly arguments. And again, the arguments tend to be you know, just as few letters as possible. People didn't like to type. They still don't like to type all that much, right? So you have an initial argument that's an N. If you only want the eigenvalues, I'm going to assume N stands for numbers here. I, I don't, I'm making that up. Okay. Eigenvalues only. If you also want the eigenvectors, then you pass it in a V. Okay? So we can get the V. It's happy with that. Eigenvectors only. Yes? Uh, so you might go over this then, but I keep thinking about it. So on the previous slide, yeah. can you just like briefly say some redeeming qualities for embracing that confusion for like C, C++? Redeeming like, qualities? Yeah, like, oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> feel like being confused? Or? It's not... You see, I don't consider it necessarily a fault of C and C++ mm -hmm. or a fault of Fortran. It's simply a convention within. The problem here is that in order to be sure that we have a BLOSS and LAPAC that we can access on all these machines, we're assuming that we have a Fortran interface, a standard Fortran interface available. If we didn't do that, if we used a C interface for these, this issue would not come oh, up. Oh, okay. If we had, and there are C interfaces but I just can't be positive they're going to be available to me when I take my code to, say, Hokey Speed or, or out to one of the Xseed resources. But I know that there's going to be the Fortran interface, so I have to do this. Also, I should say that what we really have in most codes like this is that we have libraries of wrapper functions that do this once for you so that you don't have to think about it ever again. <laughs> Whoever developed those interfaces, those wrappers, they thought about it then, but otherwise, you don't think about it. Okay, any others? All right. Um, the second argument here has to do with whether or not the matrix you're handle, handing it, since it's a symmetric matrix, if you're, if you're storing only the lower triangle or the upper triangle, I don't mean packed, I just mean the full square matrix contains only the upper or lower triangle. You don't need to worry about this at all if you're passing it in the complete symmetric matrix, which in the examples that we do, we will be. So just set it to you, for example, if you're happy. I'm not going to say any more about that argument. The dimension of the symmetric matrix is n. There's a, again, same statements that I made about DGEM apply here. If it's Fortran, you're just handing it in the name of the matrix that you're dealing with. If it's C and C++, you're handing it a pointer to the beginning of that matrix in memory. Note, however, that in this case, that matrix is going to be destroyed. So if you really, what I mean by destroyed is that the data that you give it in the first place in that memory is going to be corrupted. It gets used for things during the course of the calculation. So if you really want to keep that matrix, you better have a copy of it somewhere else before you call the function. Uh, and in fact, if you've asked for eigenvectors, the content of that matrix will be replaced with the eigenvectors themselves. If it's in Fortran, what do you know? The eigenvectors are going to be the columns. And C and C++, they're going to be the rows, just the transposes of each other. Uh, LDA has the same meaning that it did in DGEM. That's the row dimension of the matrix in Fortran, the true allocated matrix in Fortran, or the column dimension of it in C and C++. W is a one-dimensional array that will contain the eigenvectors, excuse me, eigenvalues of the matrix when the function exits, if everything goes wrong. Okay? So you have to allocate it using dynamic allocation in either Fortran or C, you have to allocate the space for that array before you pass it in, okay? Okay, so that has to be allocated. Work is a, another uh, array that is just temporary storage. The, the, unlike the BLOSS calculations, they don't need any extra memory to do their work, right? BLOSS doesn't need any extra memory. LAPAC, some of those functions do need additional space. They need some temporary storage. You have to give it to them. Okay? Work is simply a, a, an array that contains memory for temporary use. And L work is the length of that. And there's a way to, to normally what I do for this, just to be safe, and if I'm not doing gigantic matrices, is I make L work, that is the length of the work array, three times N. 
you can probably get away with much shorter than that. And there's a way to have the, pro the function tell you what the optimal value should be. But I just do three times in if I don't want to work. Okay. And info, this is a return value. It's zero if everything went well. Um, it's negative if one of your arguments was wrong. <laughs> if, it, if your argument didn't make any sense to it. It's positive if there was a convergence problem. Okay. All right, so where do we stand now? Optimized. This is, this is echoing a lot of what Professor Vallejo told you. Okay? I think he tried to emphasize to you how important it is to optimize something like a matrix-matrix multiplication. And he gave you specific examples, or, or a DAX speed for that matter, right? He gave you specific examples of how you go about optimizing. You did loop unrolling or, or blocking uh, of, the, of the loops in the matrix-matrix multiply. And he showed, I think, pretty effectively how well that can be done. Or at least he started you on the path to see how well it can be done. It's actually hard really hard to squeeze everything out of the processor that you can. But it's also, because we try to orient all computational chemistry software to make use of these linear algebra functions, because they can be very well optimized on so many different types of hardware, it's, it's absolutely vital that you use a very well optimized gloss and LaPack pair of libraries on whatever system. If you're doing production level calculations, you really need them to be as optimized as you can get, because it will speed up the code dramatically. And I'm going to work through an example in a few minutes to show you. Okay. What are some of the possibilities? Well, there's lots of them. Okay, there are lots and lots of gloss and pack libraries out there that are optimized. These are some of the ones that we've dealt with most often in the first place. Um, NetLib should never be used for production level. Okay, all when I have NetLib up here, this is the original source of these libraries. You can go out to netlive.org and you can download Bloss and LaPack and build them. And as I'm going to demonstrate, that this is just the straight code. It's all Fortran too, right? All Fortran code. Uh, the raw version of it, no optimizations whatsoever, except for the original algorithms themselves. There's no optimizations associated with the computer that you're dealing with. Um, it's free. That's great. That's important. But never use it for real production level. The performance is just too poor. Uh, the Intel MKL, the math kernel library, superb. Extremely well optimized in ways that nobody knows how, right? Somehow they've done this, uh, and they don't tell you how they've done this. They just know how their processors work and are structured, uh, and it costs. Most of the time, it doesn't directly cost you. You don't have to pull out your wallet or write a check or something. If you've got access to the machine, somebody paid for getting the MKL. Uh, and in educational environments, actually, they'll give you the MKL. Depending on what you're using it for, you can get versions of this for free. The IBM Engineering and Scientific Subroutine Library, ESSL, this is not used as much these days because it was designed for the PowerPC architecture, um, which is not as much used, at least not on the systems that I deal with. Other people may disagree. Also costs something. Katsushi Goto uh, devised a, a BLOSS library that is just, it's amazingly impressive. This is entirely hand-optimized assembler code. And he developed this, he started developing this quite a few years ago, but most recently it's been very well optimized for the Intel Nahalam architecture and the AMD Opteron, and one other uh, that, that I haven't used before. But he just did this himself. And he, this is when he was with the, the Texas uh, Advanced Computing Center, TAC. Um, and he's made this available under a BSD license. And it, for a while there, it was outperforming some things like the MKL or the ESSL. It's very impressive piece of work. I just can't imagine what it would have taken to actually dive into all assembler code underneath there to, to hand optimize these things. I mean, assembler is ugly, ugly, ugly stuff. But he had more patience than I guess anybody else. Um, finally, I'll mention the automatically tuned linear algebra subroutines or Atlas library. This is a self tuning suite of loss functions and some, a few of the LAPAC functions, about a, uh, eight or ten of the LAPAC functions are, are also optimized. You know, what did you do with Professor Vallejo this morning when you're looking at matrix matrix multiplications? You looked at blocking these matrices or loop unrolling, as sometimes called. Well, how many loops you unroll or how large the block size you choose, that depends partly on the architecture that you're dealing with, right? If you've got a highly vectorizable uh, process or highly vectorizable architecture, then you might want to be able to unroll to expose the vectorization of the calculation to the, to the compiler that can take advantage of it. 
that's important, but it depends on the system that you're working on. Sometimes shorter loops, or in a further system, longer loops is maybe necessary. And there's a whole range of these things. It also depends on the size of your caches uh, and, and a lot of other functions that matter. And so it takes some empirical tuning on different systems to get this to the ideal level, if you possibly can. That's the idea behind Atlas. They, they've got a series of parameters, such as number of loops to unroll, size of these different caches, and so on and so forth. And all it does is try lots of things. It, it plays with the parameters to maximize the flock count. And whatever it finds is the best flock count, and notice those could be different for these different types of matrix-matrix multiplication. You get a different way to orient the algorithm if you're doing A times B versus A times B transpose. Those can be quite different in the end, but it develops a different uh, heuristic for each of those automatically. And it does a pretty darn good job. It's also nice that it's free. So it's under a BSD license, and you can just download it and configure it and give it a shot. It does a pretty good job. It does a pretty good job. But again, I want to stress the importance of optimizing, using an optimized Blossom or Pack library. Hopefully, you don't have to do it yourself. But it's really important if you want the most performance out of your code on a given architecture, you need to use a Blossom or Pack that's been 